All right, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. This is the endocrine tutoring session. I've got some chat questions coming through. So let me just go ahead and take a quick look at those. Can I cover slide 23? So let me go ahead and share my screen. This was an updated slide. Um, thank you, son. So some of you in your studies may have thought I was going crazy. Um, I have no idea how they got so mixed up, but in general, anytime you're talking about non-modifiable risk factors, you are talking about things that cannot be changed. So things like biologic gender, your DNA is what it is, genetics cannot be changed, advanced age cannot be changed, or just age in general. I mean, we can go to lots of stores and buy lots of stuff to look younger, or we can act younger, we can exercise to feel younger, but that doesn't change our, our current age. And then the modifiable things are aspects of health and disease process that can be improved. So hormone supplement may be uh, something that's modifiable or obesity. Uh, by exercise, you can lose weight and you can gain weight and sedentary lifestyle. You can get up and move around more. You can manage and cope your stress. So I, I believe in the updated version of the PowerPoint um, that also included the tweak to the hypo and hyperparathyroid slide. Um, this was also updated in it. So all of the aspects that are currently in the modifiable are things that you can improve on. The non-modifiable are aspects that cannot be changed. Um, so let me see. Okay. And then what is the main difference between aldosterone and ADH? Um, is it just that aldosterone is what's coming from the actual adrenal gland? Okay, so aldosterone and ADH are, um, I don't want to say polar opposites, but they have really nothing to do with each other. So aldosterone is a steroid from the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex. Antidiuretic hormone comes from the posterior pituitary and works on the kidneys to control water, water excretion and balance. So um, there is no main difference because they have nothing to, like, they're not even similar. They don't relate to each other. They, they don't work on the same systems. Um, I mean, aldosterone has some aspect of retaining fluid because it manages electrolytes like sodium, but it it's... ADH doesn't have anything to do with even sodium. It doesn't manage fluid balance from sodium. So um, so I wouldn't, yeah, in trying to distinguish them, there is nothing that's related to each other there. They are completely different hormones that work on completely different processes. Um, and if anything, uh, I mean, the more you have of aldosterone or the more you have of antidiuretic hormone, the more you're going to be holding water or fluid, um, 
but from very different situations. Um, can you review the differences between type one and type two diabetes? Um, yes, except I'm gonna have you all do it. So I'm going to put the whiteboard up here and I'm gonna let you go to your annotate uh, option and you can click text and then type in answers. So we'll do diabetes mellitus one and we'll do diabetes mellitus two and I'm gonna draw a line between these. And so I would like for everybody to take a minute and go to your annotate function in Zoom and just go ahead and start typing in your answers to diabetes type one, diabetes type two. So it's going to be a whole lot easier if you use the text option under annotate to type in your answers. But before I review it, I want to see what people know or what they think they know. So go ahead and
All right. So below this line, let's go ahead and put um, disease processes. Body attacks own pancreas. Yes, that's autoimmune. So I'll put that up here. So treatments and or um how do I want to do this? What are the common disease process issues among both? Let's go ahead. And then, so treatment, sub-Q injections of insulin. Is both, yeah, go ahead and put the commonalities between these two diseases. Keep them coming. Got 26 people in here. Good group. Keep them coming. common signs and symptoms, common issues, be specific, imbalanced glucose levels, be maybe a little more specific there. Because the more specific you are, the more you're going to show that you understand what's going on. Keep them coming. Um, vision issues. Yes, but what's that called? Does anybody know what that's called? Again, I'm still waiting on the specificity of... imbalanced glucose issues. So retinopathy is your vision. What goes with neuropathy? Um, how do you just, like what's renal failure? Annotate button is under your options of one of your drop down spots in the the zoom functions renal failure what's that called
Good. All right, so um, doing a great job of putting some of these pieces together. If you are in the background and you're uncertain of why things are in these locations, this is being recorded. Um, these are aspects that I would definitely hope that you would have a good understanding of not just that they're present, but why they're present. So looking at diabetes mellitus, it is an autoimmune or infection related issue where the beta cells are destroyed, which means you are dependent on external insulin. Um, Medica oral meds that work on the pancreas are not going to work with type one diabetes because you are dependent on external insulin uh, resources. Onset is typically early, that's when those disease processes typically uh, take out the pancreas, the beta cells. Irreversible, children are small and scrawny because they don't have the glucose in the cells present to grow. You know, it's, it's different than being obese. Glucose, um, I don't know how to put this, type one diabetes, and results in lack of energy in the cells to grow. So that's why they're small and scrawny. Type 2 diabetes is where individuals are overweight first as a precursor. It's not that being small and scrawny is a precursor to diabetes. One, it's, that's the result of it. Type 2, you start with being overweight, and that puts you at risk for type 2 diabetes. So that's that's why the populations are different. Um, exercise and healthy diet are important for a type 1 diabetic, but that's not going to fix them. Whereas it health, exercise and a healthy diet and weight loss could reduce or eradicate type 2 diabetes. So that, that's an important aspect there. Um, treatment for both is insulin, possibly. Now, that's really the only thing that type 1 diabetics are going to use as an anti-diabetic medication because insulin is an anti-diabetic med. Okay. Now, type 2 diabetes has a whole lot of other anti-diabetic medications that are also available for use depending on how far along the disease process is. So some of the anti-diabetic medications for type 2 diabetes are all of your oral meds, um, your incretin hormones, and insulin. So those are all options of uh, anti-diabetic medications for somebody with type 2 diabetes. Now, renal failure, nephropathy, neuropathy, numbness and tingling, retinopathy, your vision issues. Somebody tell me in the chat window why people develop those disease processes with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So I'm getting some answers of hyperglycemia. Great. Now take it one step further. What does hyperglycemia or chronic hyperglycemia do to the body that causes these three disease processes? Very traditional disease processes of diabetes. And start with being the most specific. 
So I have a couple people who are giving me a lot of answers. I want one answer. What is the primary reason why, like, what is it about hyperglycemia that results in these disease processes? And you want to be specific. So um, I've got some very vague answers. I want a very specific answer. Sophia, I'm going to call you out. Thickening of the capillary basement membrane. Not in nephropathy. That is what it does. That's what hyperglycemia does throughout the entire body. So what does that mean? Somebody explain what, I mean, that's what I used in the notes, but what does that mean? Thickening of the capillary basement membrane, period. Not in nephropathy, it's in, in everywhere. What is that? Capillaries are clogged, not clogged. Uh, well, are you talking about the like the vessel and the blood flow that's going through the capillary is clogged? Like this area here, is that clogged? Is that what you're talking about? Okay, so if this is clogged, what would that actually be called? Like, if this is my capillary here, and there was a clog right here, what would that be called? A clot, right. So that can't be what we're talking about here with being clogged or the screen analogy, because we're not talking about the lumen that, that's a clot. This is not a clot problem. Um, keep thinking. I'll be right back. All right, so this is a uh, virtual background. Let me get rid of the virtual background. All right, so let's imagine this is our capillary here, all right? This is our capillary. Blood's flowing right there. See those holes? Okay. Fluid in the capillary in here has to go in and out through the capillary basement membrane. Okay. This is where your osmotic pressure is. It's controlling fluid in and out of the capillary through those tiny holes. Okay. Now, if those, if this membrane thickens, inflamed, but it really, it's just it thickens, what happens to those holes that are useful in allowing fluids and nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out? 
they they close up. So then what happens to the cells that are out here? Like here's all the cells. This is the capillary. This is your vascular system here where my hand is. Here's all the cells. What happens to those cells? Uh, cells don't move anyways. What happens to these cells if these holes shrink up and get smaller and close because they've, you know, the basement membrane has thickened? Now I'm seeing people understanding. Nothing's going to get out of the capillaries. It's nothing's oxygen's not leaving nutrients aren't leaving fluids not moving to the cells waste products from the cells aren't going back into the capillaries to be you know travel to where they get excreted so necrosis these cells die they die now what capillaries am i talking about What capillaries am I talking about? In essence, where is the sugar in the body like that we're talking about? It's in the bloodstream. Well, isn't this the bloodstream? So where in the body are these capillary membranes thickening? Where? Everywhere. That's right. Because the body is not saying, oh, we're going to affect these over something. Like, it's not a specific location in the body. Every single capillary in the body, every single capillary in the body is starting to thicken as you have increased glucose levels chronically. All of them. So which ones are they going to impact the function of faster? The smaller ones or the bigger ones? smaller ones. Good job, Keegan. Now, where are the smallest capillary basement membranes located in the body? So uh, somebody just said lungs. My question is, have we said anything in the discussion today or really focused in class on how diabetes affects lung function? Okay. So where are the smallest blood vessels, the smallest capillaries, the ones that are going to be affected first? Where are those? the extremities, i.e. hands and feet, fingers and toes first. That's called neuropathy. Where are there other really, really, really small capillaries? Oh, in the kidneys, that's called nephropathy. And then in the eyes, that's called retinopathy. Those three locations have the smallest capillaries which means the basement membrane is going to be impacted first in those loca locations. And, and then once, you know, the smaller vessels are affected, where, what's affected next? Once the, yeah. Once the smaller ones have been influenced, then you're worried about the, the bigger ones.
like the heart, like the organs, like general vessels in the body that, you know, carry nutrients everywhere and release nutrients and pull waste products in due to osmotic pressure. Okay. There is that osmotic pressure that's higher with hyperglycemia that's pulling more fluid into the bloodstream that's causing you to maybe urinate a little bit more initially polyuria polyphagia polydipsia but but remember what happens as people have chronic diabetes what happens to their urine output Somebody with diabetes, are they always going to be polyuric? Forever and ever, until they die, they're going to have polyuria. Is, is that what happens with um, diabetes? Okay, so Tierra says no. So what happens? As this disease process progresses from early stages to late stages, you develop renal failure which results in you no longer being able to pee. So that polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia is early in this disease process. And as your body starts to fall apart um, and deteriorate because of that capillary basement membrane issue, then you end up with necrosis all over the place. That's why people get amputations, renal failure, lose their eyesight, um, yeah. Now, does renal failure kill you? Like, is that typically the ultimate cause of death um, for diabetes? It can cause death, but that's not what I asked. I said, is it typically the main cause of death for diabetic patients, people who have diabetes? Now, why is it not the main cause of death? Granted, it is a big influencer, but why? What keeps, because renal failure will kill you, but why is it not a listed as the main cause of death for diabetic patients? Even though it's one of the first things that happen. Yeah, they're going to go on dialysis. Right. So, oh, so we get renal failure. I will go on dialysis. I mean, is losing my eyesight going to kill me? No. I mean, it shows me that I've got chronic complications, but losing my eyesight's not going to kill me. Kill me. Nef neuropathy, like can't feel my fingers and toes or my legs or my arms, literally that bad. You get amputations if there's enough necrosis, but that doesn't kill you. Yes, infection can kill you, but that's not typically what does. It's when those capillary basement membranes start to be affecting the larger vessels like the ones in the heart or the brain. Now, you're typically not going to die of a stroke with diabetes because this is not a clot. Remember, this is not clot or um, atherosclerosis, okay? So I had saw some people state that. This is not plaque buildup. This is not, we haven't dealt with that yet. That's next content, but it's not a clot. It's that this membrane thickens and results in poor movement of nutrients and waste products across that membrane where you end up killing your cells. So, um, I just got, I'm going to go back through the questions here to make sure I've, I've covered what I, you know, has been asked, but I just got one I want to deal with. So, what brain condition will cause death from hyperglycemic patients? Now, 
I'm going to back up a little bit. Hypoglycemia will kill you because the brain doesn't have any energy then. Because remember, the brain doesn't need insulin to, to get glucose. But if you have no glucose, you have no brain energy, your brain shuts down, you die. Hypoglycemia, very quickly. Okay. Hyperglycemia can also put you into a coma and kill you but it takes a long time to get there like really like i'm not saying years but we're talking about months typically for somebody who's even slightly managing their glucose even as it continues to elevate 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 way high it's going to take a long time to get to that point but i think what the question's asking is related to treatment so Let me go back to this screen thing here. All right. So if there's a whole lot of glucose, in, I'm going to have to take this to class next time. A um, whole lot of glucose, it's just a decoration for a shelf, but it works. In the capillary, tell me what changes. Whole lot, remember, hyperglycemia, a lot of glucose in in the capillary now you say pressure but that means nothing to anybody you have to be specific you guys are bound you're passing the important part start with the important part i have a lot of glucose in here what changes when i have a lot of glucose in here I see a lot of people saying pressure or increased pressure, but I, I don't I don't really know what you mean by that. What's going on? Glucose, pressure. What pressure? We've been talking about this all semester. What pressure changes? You can't just say pressure because there's lots of different pressures. There we go. Osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure changes. What happens as a result of increased osmotic pressure in the capillary? There's a whole lot of glucose in here. What happens? Fluid goes into, okay goes through these little holes, fluid is pulled into the capillary. So the capillary, I'll try and swells a little bit, okay? There's more fluid in there, okay? Maybe it doesn't swell, and then, you know, there's more blood pressure there that way too. There's lots of different things that could change, but really I want you to focus on the osmotic pressure. Fluid is being pulled into here. Now, that's under normal conditions. And then you end up having a sugar of 300 or 400 or 800 or 1200. Okay. And we're pulling lots of fluid into the capillary. Okay. Lots and lots. So the body starts to get used to it, not compensate. It just starts to get used to it. Doesn't like it but there isn't anything it can do about it unless you give some insulin. So what if we give a huge amount of insulin? What's going to happen all of a sudden? It's not going to rupture. What's going to happen as a result of giving a huge amount of insulin? Glucose is going to drop rapidly, which will result in what other change? Don't say edema yet. you got to start with the basic steps. You are going to lower the glucose in the vessels, not hypo. 
You don't even have to become normal. If you go from 1,200 to 600, that's a huge change. If you go from 800 to 200, you're still not normal. But what happens as a result of lowering, rapidly lowering the glucose? There we go. Now the fluid is going to be pulled back out here. It's going to get pulled rapidly out of the capillaries because all of a sudden the body's like, wait a minute, I'm lower, doesn't mean normal, lower glucose in my capillaries. That means fluid, you need to leave, go elsewhere. So it leaves the capillaries and comes out here into the interstitial space, causing edema. You're right, but you, you can't jump to the edema until you realize where it's coming from, okay? Where in the body am I really concerned about this all of a sudden pushing of fluid and edema in the body? Where am I really concerned about that happening because all of a sudden I drop glucose? The brain. That's why we call it cerebral edema, which can kill you. Now, remember what I just said. I didn't make the person normal glucose. I didn't make them hypoglucose. I just lowered it too fast. So when somebody's 1,200, what's the treatment? Is it give a large dose of sub-Q insulin? No, it is small doses. How? How do we administer glucose when somebody is in DKA or HHNKS where their sugar is way elevated? We put them on a drip so that their body doesn't all of a sudden shoot the fluid out of the vessels into the interstitial space or into the brain and cause cerebral edema and death. Because you don't want that rapid change. You want slow changes. So we're going to give a small amount of IV regular insulin through a drip to slowly bring down their glucose. Now, if I were to take you back to um, sliding scale, um, Sliding scale. I'll just leave off the virtual background for now. I want you to look at something here. How much insulin do you give somebody if their uh, sugar is 450? Okay, I just had somebody say dextrose or saline. Um, not, no, I just want to make sure you're understanding. You give insulin for somebody who has high sugar. Okay, that, that's the treatment. But how you administer it is important. You don't just give them a huge dose. You give them like, okay, so what if somebody's sugar is 600? How much do you give them? What if it's 800? How much do you give them? 1,200, how much do you give them? 1,600, how much do you, it's the same amount. Why? Why is it the same amount? Why does the order like, yeah, Keegan, there we go. Because you don't want to drop it too fast. If you start giving 16, 20, 50, 100 units of insulin, you're not going to make them hypoglycemic. You know, if somebody's a thousand glucose, 
given 50 or 100 probably is not going to even bring them back to normal. But it's going to drop them too fast where you would end up causing cerebral edema and killing them. So what's the important aspect of this? You call the doc. The doc orders additional insulin or insulin drip, or he says what needs to happen beyond that. Right. That's why. Um, all right, so I need to scroll back through here. It's a great discussion, um, but I want to make sure that I'm hitting all this stuff here. All right. Dun, dun, dun. So I'm going to go back. Why is the serum glucose level for HHNK higher than DKA? So I'm going to go to that slide. Okay, so um, here are 44 and 45. Now, what is the difference between type 1 and type 2? And honestly, if somebody just wants to hit the space bar and talk, that would be great. Um, I feel like I lose my mind when it's just me, my own voice talking here. Um, I, can't, I can't scroll back and forth. So I know people are in the chat window, but I need you to just talk to me here. Hold down the space bar like a walkie talkie. Type one does not produce insulin. Type, so how quickly does their sugar change? very quickly okay type two somebody else how how quickly does their sugar change It's on the slide. Slowly. Slow. Why? They produce some insulin. Right. So if you're producing some insulin, it's going to take much longer for you to elevate. So type ones, poof, no insulin, boom, it's quick. It changes. Type twos, no insulin and they eat, it goes up. Well, it's it's a little bit of insulin. It just doesn't work as well. So it takes a little bit longer. And the body just sort of gets used to a little bit more elevated glucose. And remember, there's a little bit of insulin. It just doesn't work quite as well. So there's some energy being made the right way because some glucose is getting into the cell. So the body's sort of just, the only analogy that comes to my mind is cooking frog legs, which really they just taste like chicken, honestly. Um, sorry if I'm offending any Kermit fans, but if you want to cook a frog, if you want to cook frog legs, you put a frog in water and you turn up the heat slowly to the point where they don't even know they're being cooked. Their body just sort of gets used to that warmer water. It just sort of keeps, and then all of a sudden, whew, okay, now I'm done. Whereas if you put a frog in hot water right away, it's going to jump out because it's like, whoa, I don't like that. Okay. Type ones, frog in boiling water, boom, changes fast, and the body feels it. Cooking of frog legs the right way, slow, insidious, you don't really see it happening, and then you get way high, and you're like, whoa, not working here. That's the difference. Now, DKA type one, HHNKS, or HHS, or HHNK something with two H's, okay? 
H H something. They're, they all mean the same thing. What is the difference between DKA and HHS? And don't tell me insulin. It's not insulin. And again, I can't I can't scroll because I'm looking at uh, two other questions I don't want to lose here. So just somebody tell me what's the main difference in those two disease processes, two disease processes. Don't tell me glucose. Don't tell me insulin. How do I know? Because remember, type 1s go right into DKA, type 2s go HHS, and then into DKA. How do I know if somebody is in HH, NKS, or DKA? Don't tell me glucose. Don't tell me insulin. Yeah. yeah, urine does not have um, ketones yet. Good. Now, does that, if there's ketones in the urine... That's not the best indicator, but that definitely is one of them, okay? So ketones in the urine tells me I'm I'm where? Where am I with that? Ketoacidosis. Okay. okay. And there's ketones in the urine because there's ketones in the bloodstream now. The yeah. urine is just peeing some of them off. Good. Somebody else, what's another even better indicator that you are in DKA versus HHNKS? Metabolic acidosis. Explain. How so do you your know body, you're in metabolic acidosis? Your body's compensating by the Kussmuller's respirations. Not and comp the Remember, compensating does not tell me I'm in a problem. What tells me I'm in metabolic acidosis? The it's pH. Not the pH, okay. The respirations. That's compensation. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, how do I know somebody's in acidosis? Their pH? Their neurostatus. Neurostatus. What's the neurostatus going to be? agitated uh opposite so they're gonna be uh, no it's not a, it's the same lethargic. acidosis and ph remember ph goes down nervous system goes down alkalosis ph goes up nervous system goes up okay so now, then you have all the compensatory things like Kussmaul's breathing. Now, yes, that's a part of the compensation. And that happens when you're moving towards or partially or uncompensated DKA. But the only way I know definitively is what's the pH? What's my nervous system? Now, you might be looking, some of you might be looking at the slide going, wait a minute, but their unconscious or level of alertness is different, is low with HHS also. Why is it low? Because it's not due to the acidosis here. Why is it low? This, this is an important process. Why is the level of consciousness, the neurostatus, diminished with HHNKS? It's on the slide.
what seems to be repeated in the green box what seems to be the focus of having a really really high glucose with osmotic pressure that's pulling fluid into the capillaries and then you're having polyuria and what happens because of that dehydration right so acidosis will cause your nervous system to go down but so will dehydration if you get really dehydrated you're gonna pass out you're going to decrease your cognitive function not because of acidosis but because of the dehydration okay so if i can't look at the nervous system as an indicator in this situation to decide are we acidic or not how are we going to definitively decide if somebody is in acidosis one thing how do you know you're acid acidic the ph ph Okay, this is a situation where looking at their nervous system may not tell you what you need to know. You have to just look at the pH. Okay, that's the best answer. What if you don't have the pH yet? You're on the side of the road, you're at home, you're with friends, and they start to become more lethargic, and you know they're diabetic, and you don't have a lab yet how might you now okay because again we deal with the best answer first get the blood draw but if we don't have it now how can we evaluate their status and it isn't going to be by neuro neuro status because that doesn't tell me one or the other how do i know somebody's moving towards dka then go ahead and list their their breath right now the smell of their breath now is when you start going for some of those compensations. And I, I, I know some of you are like, wait a minute, why is he backtracking? Why is he being contradictory? I'm not being contradictory. I'm really wanting you to see the prioritization. What do you look for first? You look for the pH and the neurostatus. Well, the neurostatus doesn't help you because you're going to be lethargic in both of them. So that's out. The pH, oh, I need the pH, except when that's not present, now I have to look at those other things. So ketones in the urine, cool small breathing, sm sweet smelling breath, um, you know, those aspects, their compensations, they do indicate we're moving in that direction. And if that's all you have, then great, but don't look at those first that's that's this whole process of step by step by step by step and i can't see anybody's faces to get validation that you understand this process but this is how you nurse the nurse how you do nursing prioritization what's the best answer what's the first thing you're going to look for it's their ph it's their neurostat well neurostat is not going to work ph great oh it's not present so now I need to look at those other things. All right. Um, slide 84. Okay. So essentially, what, what do you do if, and again, keep, I like the answers. Hit the space bar, talk to me here. What do you do if somebody is low sugar? Give them, food. Sugar. give them sugar, give them food. So if the scenario that you're in has an unconscious patient, how, how are you going to give them food? Or how are you going to treat them? IV. Or? Polis. Or what? Oles? Oles? I said bolus, but. Okay. So the IV is going to be the bolus. Right. Of what? What are we giving them? Dextrose? Glucose. Yes. I just wanted to make sure you didn't say insulin. <laughs> We're giving them sugar. Okay. 
Now, you could also do that IM. You could also do that sub Q. Like if you're at home, people have glucagon shots. They're not IVs, they're sub Qs or IMs, but people like sub Q better. So, boom, we give a shot of glucose. Great. If they're able to eat, then we're going to use that route first. It's easier to manage, easier to control. So, this PO part, where it's 15 grams, it's the 15, 15, 15 rule, which, or 15, 15 rule, I don't care how many 15s you say, but you give them 15 grams, you wait 15 minutes, then you recheck. If they're still low, you give them another 15 grams, you wait 15 minutes, you recheck. If they're still low, you give them 15 grams, you wait 15 minutes, and you guys get the picture. Good night, love. No, I won't because I'm going to sleep in. Have fun at school. All right. So um, 15 grams. This is important. Giving a sip of orange juice, while orange juice is a good drink-ish, some people are saying it's not so much anymore, but whatever. If you give them a sip of fruit juice, that's not enough. It's got to be four ounces, a half a glass. That counts as one intervention, okay? Don't be like, oh, well, yeah, I've been feeding them sips of orange juice and they've been nibbling on this cracker. Well, if they're nibbling on a cracker, like that cracker and peanut butter, the whole thing is essentially 15 grams or a half a sandwich half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That is, you know, it's not like they're just nibbling and nibbling and nibbling. Oh, they got to be getting better because they're starting to eat a sandwich. No, 15, that whole half, the half sandwich is one dose. So you got to understand that there is a dosing amount that counts as one dose of that 15. And you're going to see questions like somebody takes a piece of candy. Well, that's not enough because you need three to five pieces to count as one dose. You literally take a handful of Halloween candy, shove it in your mouth, chew it up, swallow it. That's 15 grams. Boom. Done. Okay. So very important because if you give them just a little bit, like a sip, oh, and here's some crackers, they're going to keep crashing. You're not giving them enough. So very, very important there. Um, do, 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 do. They scroll and scroll and... Okay, so that's just people. Okay, um, other, I think that's all the questions that um, I had presented um, to me. What I was hoping to do was to go through some case studies. Um, Oh, I do. That's going. To, that's going to school for class next semester. Did that help with the whole like, what's going on using that capillary thing? Okay, cool. I've always wanted like how to explain that better, but that yeah, just happened to have that. All right. Um. So let me pull up. Some case studies, new share. All right. So I want to roll through this quickly. So um, 
quick answers. You can unmute, talk, or real quick typing. I want to go through this. So name the disease, name what's causing the disease, name what you do about the disease. Again, unmute or type it in. What's the disease? What's causing the disease? What do you do about the disease? And if you can type it all into one answer, that would be great. Be specific. So I'm sending that one back to you, Jeff. Got to be more specific on what's causing the disease. Again, looking for some more answers here. I got Demetia and Jeff answering. All right, Deb, thank you. So we've got, it is dwarfism. It is a lack of growth hormone. And Deb, thanks for being specific. At birth, okay, early in life, what's the treatment? Give them growth hormone. Excellent. Now, what are some complications of dwarfism? There's a real obvious one. Again, I like really obvious answers. I, I don't think I've said that enough, and I don't think a lot of students understand. I want obvious answers because if they're obvious to you and me, we need to make sure we talk to our patients about it because they didn't go through these classes. They don't know what's obvious. So what's the most obvious implication of dwarfism? Nice. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think Jeff's going after the Oompa Loompas being short. All right. Great. Okay. That's the obvious one. What are some of the other potential implications for these individuals? Improper development of organs. Excellent. Bone deformities. Okay, decreased lifespan. Okay, that is, uh, now it's not, not so much anymore, but yes, it is a little bit shorter. Sorry for the pun. That's just awful. Um, it, it is uh, slightly decreased, slightly shorter lifespan. Um. Cool. All right. Weakness. I was hoping for another one. Like weakness is a is a big deal with this. The body wasn't designed to be really tall. It wasn't de designed to be really short either. Now, contractures are another issue. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, if you if you not that you're staring at small people, but you'll notice that a lot of times they have. Um, it almost appears to have contractures with their arms and legs a little bit. They don't have the same range of motion. Um, all right. Step two, again, real fast. Let's whip through this here. What's the disease? What's the cause? What's the treatment? Great. Gigantism. That's out there. Excess growth hormone, be more specific. I'm going to come get you, Jeff. Be more specific. There we go. I'm going to, I'm going to give Jeff a chance. From birth, early in life, before puberty, which essentially means at any point before puberty, okay, excess growth hormone prior to puberty, it, 
the implications are they're really tall. They are weak. Now, what's our treatment? It's not necessarily weaker bones. They're not fragile. They have weak muscle. Now, there is some risk of fractures maybe because the bones are much longer than they really were designed to be. But the weakness comes from the lack of muscle function um, because of the extreme height. So they're weaker than necessarily the bones. Okay, what's the treatment? Because again, people didn't really tell me the full specific cause of this. I just heard people say excess growth hormone prior to puberty. From what? And, I mean, that's that's gigantism, but that isn't what caused it. What caused gigantism? Okay, excess growth hormone is the disease process. That's not what, okay, that causes the symptoms of the disease. I want to know what actually caused the disease. Like what caused the excess growth hormone to occur? And this is not a metabolism issue with the thyroid. This is a pituitary problem anterior pituitary problem and a number of you are saying a tumor of the anterior pituitary gland absolutely correct excess growth hormone excess hormone production comes from a tumor what caused gigantism it's a tumor in the brain so what's the treatment remove the tumor but then they're not going to have growth hormones so what do we do yeah we give it to them all right there we go what is it actually i'm just going to do this one this is acromegaly you see the before on the right and the after on the left this is what happens from too much growth hormone after puberty. Why? Too much growth hormone after puberty. A tumor. And so we would cut it out. Now, would we need to really give them much growth hormone? I mean, like, are they growing anymore? Is that the only thing that growth hormone does? Uh, yeah, it's not the only thing that growth hormone does. Growth hormone is not only needed prior to puberty. You do need it after puberty. It's a it's a hormone. Now, depending on the age and how bad the symptoms are, will determine the treatment and how much growth hormone we may or may not administer. The growth hormone does have other purposes as well. All right, here we go. Name the disease, name the hormone cause, and maybe even the cause of the hormone problem. And what are we going to do about it? Um, so look at the picture and tell me what you think is in that cup based on what you have. Because it's not just water that they're peeing. It, it, they're still urinating, but it's 
more water than usual. So what's our problem? Diabetes insipidus. The hormone imbalance is deficit of ADH from the posterior pituitary gland. Now, that could be related. Would that be because of a tumor of the ADH section? No, it would be maybe nearby. Or maybe there's no tumor at all. There's no tumor at all. But you had an infection of that area or that caused it to produce less. Or stress, right? Stress might end up causing some hormone imbalance. There's other things that can cause these problems, but the fact that you diabetes insipidus. Now, what's the treatment for diabetes insipidus? Desmopressin, which is the ADH replacement. Okay. What else is going to be a treatment? Come on, think like nurses here. What's going on? What's the problem? How are we going to fix it? How are we going to deal with the signs and symptoms? What's, you know, what's the process here? Yes, we're going to give them drugs to hopefully take care of it, but what else? Um, okay, so there, this is, okay. So in the question, yeah, there isn't a tumor listed. And that's dealing with the, if there is a tumor, then yes, we'd remove the tumor and we, you know, it would be a nearby tumor. But I want you to deal with just what's here. What's here? What are you going to do? Diet, exercise, not it. That's, that's not going to help this person. We are thinking priority right now. Do not think down the road. Think right now. How are we going to deal with this patient right now? We're going to give them desmopressin because that's what they need. What else do they need right now? Um, mm. Be specific of what you need. A lot of you are, I think, giving some blanket answers, hoping that you're close. If you said fluid, you're wrong. If you said electrolyte replacement, you're wrong. What is ADH a loss of? Don't, oh Lord, don't, I mean... Uh, thank you. Water. Water is it. Do not give them electrolytes. They're already hyper concentrated. If you give them electrolytes, if you give them sodium, if you give them potassium, if you give them magnesium, if you give them any, they're, you're going to make it worse. What did they lose? Water. What do they need? water. So you give them water through the IV. You give them water through the oral cavity. Don't, I'll, I'll, I think a lot of people like, oh, well, they're losing this and I'm going to go pick something that's close to it. No, you don't want to pick close to it. You want to focus on the direct problem. So if this is an issue where somebody excretes excessive amounts of water, did I say they excreted electrolytes? No. Did I? They are keeping their electrolytes. They are losing water. What do they need? Water and the hormone. That's what they need. So be specific. I think that's where a lot of students think they're close in understanding because they're picking things that sound like we talked about them. Just deal with the question. All right. So here's another one. 
right here, right now, what's going on? So they have an increased amount of ADH. It's called SIADH. We call that SIADH. Now, if they're craving salt, should we give them salt? No. We should not give them salt. Because what's going on with this disease process? Let's, before you answer, you got to think, hmm. How would salt change this? Well, the disease process is that they're holding water. They're not urinating water. They already have fluid retention. So if we give them salt, what's going to happen? It's going to make it worse. This is why slow down, think what's going on, and then, to, yeah, see, that makes more sense. Let's give some diuretics. Or let's treat the problem. What's the problem? They have an excessive amount of hormone, probably a tumor. Let's cut it out. And, and well, that's going to mean that they are going to lose their ADH. So what are we going to do? We don't give ADH. We, like, we don't actually give ADH, what do we give? Like, there we go. It's Desmopressin because <laughs> we don't give ADH. Like, that's not the drug. It's Desmopressin is the drug that's the ADH replacement. So we need to understand what's going to happen with that. So we're going to give... And again, don't just say replacement therapy, be specific. Desmopressin is the replacement therapy. We're going to give them that. We're going to give them fluids? Nope. Not sodium, not potassium. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. If they're super... This gets, uh, what are the electrolyte levels in a person with SIADH? What are the electrolyte levels? Okay. So again, I think some of you are answering too quickly. Where's the water? be specific where's the water in the bloodstream what would that do to the electrolyte levels it would make them low so you have really low levels of sodium potassium magnesium phosphorus calcium i don't like that that could cause its own problems so in the process of giving diuretics we may also give electrolytes to replace what has been lost, but that doesn't fix the problem. We have to cut the tumor out, get rid of the problem first. Otherwise, we're just we're swimming upstream. It, it, it's not going to work. You're, you're going to be trying to manage a whole bunch of symptoms that are just going to get more complicated because you didn't deal with the problem. You got to deal with the problem. Cut the tumor out, then manage whatever's left. But your immediate answer isn't give them stuff. It's, it's we got to get rid of the tumor. Um, all right, here you go. What is it? 
and we've talked a lot about it, so I'm going to move on. Here you go. What are you going to do about it? What's going on? What are you going to do about it? What's going on? What are you going to do about it? So uh, there we go. You got to first decide what's going on. That's enough information for determining a disease process. Exactly. I got 24 people here and I have like four answers. Should be scrolling through them. Send them in. What's going on? You got to know these answers. Like, what is this disease process? I want like five more people to tell me what the disease is. Be specific. So they're young. They're peeing a lot, they're thirsty a lot, they're hungry a lot. Diabetes type one. Because they're young, increased hunger, increased thirst, increased urination. That's where you start saying, oh, well, what is that? Oh, that's polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. All right, so now we have type one. Now... Here's our situation. What's going on as a part of the disease process and what are you going to do about it? You getting gray hair, Cole? No. Oh. It's all right. I was 16 when I started getting gray. I just stressed about school too much. I can go into pictures. You don't stress about school, though, do you? No. no. All right. So if you give insulin in this situation, you kill the person. Because being restless and cold are symptoms of what? Low sugar. So don't give them insulin. You kill them. You give them sugar. Now let's be specific. You would tell this person what? What would you tell this child or what would you tell the parents? And it might even be easier if, Okay, so I want a, I want full sentences. So maybe unmute and somebody share with me what you would do in this situation. Let's talk through this. What is going to be the specific teaching or specific intervention 
that you're going to do for this 11 year old and her parents make sure that she's eating more throughout the day and throughout the sporting event or practice yeah yes i love the throughout before is really important during is important and after is important because as they exercise more they whatever insulin they gave themselves as being type one then or even if they're undiagnosed yet well hopefully they're diagnosed at this point but it's going to work better so therefore they become hypoglycemic and they need to eat more excellent all right next real life people real life what happened what's going on She's hypoglycemic. Not just a little bit. She is, she, this is not DKA. This is not HHNKS. Now, uh, okay. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say that. This could be either really low or really high sugar. It absolutely could be DKA. It absolutely could be hypoglycemia. So what would the parents be instructed to do as they're calling 911? Check her blood sugar. <laughs> yes, but even better. Maybe to see if she took her her insulin. She's unresponsive. That could have been a uh -huh. <laughs> So somebody said give her medication. That's not very specific because there's lots of medications to administer. You have to be specific. If you're going to say meds, say a medication. That way we can talk about it. Checking her breathing. Um how would that help? What do you mean, check her breathing? I had a couple people say check their breathing. She's unresponsive. Okay. She is alive, oh. but that's you're not calling. You're not checking to see if she's still alive. You're so I don't know if they were if they should have been on a long acting insulin that could have taken them throughout the night. Uh but if they were not on it, maybe they could give them a short acting one or something. Well, give them a shot of something is the best answer, but I want specifically. Rapid uh, aspart or um no. <laughs> okay. So here, yeah. here's okay. I have some people in the chat window who are given a different answer here. If, like I said, this could be DKA, this could be hypoglycemia. If it is DKA, then yeah, insulin would help. But if it's hypoglycemia, and you, I didn't say you knew what it was. I said you were treating this person, they are unresponsive. If you give them insulin, you kill them, possibly. Like 50 50 shot, you guessed. Mm, maybe they're hyperglycemia. Let's give them some insulin. Oh, no, I was wrong. I killed them. Whereas if you give them a shot of sugar or glucagon, if they're low, then you save their life. If they're high, then you didn't kill them. You take them to the hospital and treat it that way. So it's 
always safer to give glucose if you're not sure what's going on. Now, I really liked the answer, check their sugar. That will determine what your outcome is going to be. But if you're out in the world and you somebody's, you know, has a glucagon injector in their purse and they fall unresponsive, I'm just going to give it. I'm not going to waste time with checking their sugar. I'm just going to give the glucagon. We'll deal with the insulin later, but I'm going to give the glucagon. Um, I hope I hope that makes sense. Like insulin is important, but it can kill you. Glucose is important, not going to kill you in a matter of minutes. Like remember, dying from hyperglycemia takes years and decades. Okay, so giving them a little bit more glucose, eh? Oops, wrong way. We'll fix that in a minute. If I give insulin when it's the wrong time, then we kill them. So that's what you need to keep in mind. All right. This one's a type two diabetic. They're obese. They're short. They're peeing a lot. They're eating more. Heart rate's a little faster. Why is their heart rate faster? What, uh, why are, why are, why are they, why, why are they tachycardic? Again, deal with what's in the question. You have type two diabetes. They're peeing a lot. They're eating more than usual and they're a little tachycardic. What related to diabetes would cause that? Dehydration, excellent. It's not about moving glucose around faster. Glucose is already high everywhere in all vessels. It's not like it's in certain pockets of locations. It's you're dehydrated because you have hyperglycemia dumb fruit flies. All right. So same situation, even though the patient had scheduled a doctor's appointment, he started to feel really tired and drowsy. What probably is going on with this type two diabetic who also has sweet smelling breath? Yes. So they're hyperglycemic. What now, some of you said DKA, some of you said HHNKS, and some of you just said hyperglycemia. Well, hyperglycemia is not specific enough because there could be still a lot of different things. So being more specific, is it DKA or is it HHNKS? And why? Don't just give me an answer. Tell me why. So you got to give me the answer in the same, there we go. I had a couple people telling me DKA or HH and then why, right? It's DKA because even though they're type two and type two diabetics go into HHNKS first, they don't have sweet smelling breath with HHNKS. That's a ketones, ketoacidosis situation. Now, remember, the really tired and drowsy does not alert you to either DKA or HHNKS because they're going to be tired and drowsy either due to the dehydration or the acidosis, but the sweet smelling breath gives you more specifics. 
Um, drugs, definitely focus on the drugs. So up to this point, what drugs are they likely to be on? I just want to, I know that you haven't had a lot of experience, but what are some of the drugs that this patient um, is likely to be on of these? It's not all of these, it's which ones are they? Um, likely to be using to manage their their anti-diabetic medications. Metformin is most definitely there. Um, sulfonylureas and megalidinides, but sulfonylureas are a little more common, I think. And if those are not enough, they might have transitioned to insulin. Can somebody tell me which insulins they are most likely to be on? As a type 2 diabetic. Um, so if they're on metformin and sulfonylureas, um, they're most likely to start off on uh, rapid acting only, just just at meals, just to help out, because the metformin and the oral drugs are going to hopefully balance things out a little bit throughout the day. Maybe they just need a little bit of extra help, a little extra insulin at meal time. So they're probably not going to be on long acting until later on in their disease process. Um, so it just starts with those spot in the spot insulin of meal time, and then we progress to the long acting after a while. All right. So seven years later, they come back. He mentioned he started to notice a lot of bodily changes and was asked why the medication wasn't curing his disease. Answer. And again, I got maybe five more minutes here. Chat in the window or unmute, either one. This is an important type of question. Answer his situation. I have people talking about diet and exercise. While relevant, it doesn't answer the patient's right now situation. Answer his situation. Why? Was the medication not curing his disease? Got all these bodily changes I don't like. You put me on all these meds, they're not working. The medication isn't designed to cure it. It's designed to regulate and control it. Thank you. Have you to add exercise and proper diet to fix it. That's the full answer. You can't just start with diet and exercise. <laughs> oh, diet and exercise more. No, he's saying, why is the med not working? No, the med's working. But it's not working the way you thought it was going to work. The meds don't cure you. They regulate. I like that word. They manage. If you want to be cured, then you got to lose a boatload of weight and exercise and diet. And, and that's when, you know, many of my patients in the past have rolled their eyes, looked at me, go, uh-uh, just give me more meds. Well, then he ain't going to be cured. All right. So then he asked if there were future concerns to worry about. And you answer. Okay. Don't say yes. Tell me what they are. 
<laughs> what are some of the first diseases? Again, priority. Let's go in order. What are some of the first diseases they're probably going to deal with? Don't say organ failure. HHNKS and diabetic ketoacidosis are acute things. Yes, but he's already experienced those because he came in seven years ago with DKA. What is he going to now be dealing with? And again, I think when people say decreased perfusion, I don't think they understand what they're actually saying because decreased perfusion is like a blood clot. It's decreased perfusion of the actual cells and interstitial space and tissues because of that basement membrane issue. It's not decreased osmotic pressure. It's increased osmotic pressure because of the excess glucose. I want disease processes. Future concerns. What diseases do we need to worry about? What disease processes do we need to be worried about? They aren't going to know what, you don't need to worry about weight loss. I mean, that would be something he needs to do, but I'm not worried about that. That would be a good thing. I want disease processes. The patient's saying, all right, I've got diabetes. I got diabetes. What do I need to worry about? Oh, well. You need to worry about not being able to see. Good job, Deb. You need to worry about renal failure. You need to worry about nephropathy and not being able to feel things. So you're worried you're going to end up being a fall risk and you're going to have necrosis of your toes and amputations. And, you know, as that progresses, then you're going to end up with cardiovascular problems that will probably end up killing you at some point if you don't manage your sugar. If you don't lose weight, if you don't, you know, all of those things, we can live a long life. I know we keep going after these death things, but diabetic patients can live a full life, 70, 80 years, 90 years. You just got to manage it. And that's not easy. All right. So there's a goiter with these symptoms. What's going on? And remember, the goiter doesn't tell you hypo or hyper because that can occur with everything. The symptoms, what's it tell you? And why? Because again, you can't just give me an answer. I don't know if you're guessing 50-50, hyper, hypo. You got to say why. And this is, this, this is like, this is, um, I don't know if this is going to freak you out. This is the easy stuff here. Like, this is the foundation of answering test questions, of taking care of patients. Because this is just, can you identify the disease? Not what are you going to do about it or how are you going to treat it? Or, you know, this is just identifying it. So they have exophthalmus. If you look in the picture, their pulse is elevated, their respirators are elevated, their blood pressure is elevated, and their temp is elevated. That's hyperthyroidism. That's Graves' disease or thyroid toxicosis, but whatever it is, it's elevated. So what do we do? Deal with the tumor wherever it is, and then give them thyroid replacement. Now, this person... They just returned from a thyroidectomy. What are you watching for after a thyroidectomy? And I like this because it's life-threatening. Do things. Again, one word is not going to um, get it here. Because again, I don't know if you're guessing or 
I want sentences, half sentences. Hashimoto's is a autoimmune disease, not a problem in this situation. That's a chronic condition. We just came back from surgery. That's an acute condition. So hypocalcemia and thyroid toxicosis are the two things that we're worried about. How did they come into play? That Why are we at risk for having hyperthyroidism after we cut it out? Why are we at risk for hypocalcemia immediately after cutting it out? Madeline, you're right. Can you unmute and explain a little bit more of the like one word answers you're you're typing? Uh, I was just saying like a he would have a Hello? I heard you and then you lost you. Metabolism after his, um, like a stimulated nervous system. Uh, this doesn't stimulate the nervous system. Where's the, the hyper, where's the hyper metabolism coming from? Um, like taking out the goiter. Okay. But wouldn't that make them less? Like, where is this all of a sudden excessive metabolism coming from if we're taking the thyroid gland out um like the body was working too hard am i going the right way no <laughs> but this is but but you're not the only one i wanted to make sure that everybody understood this so okay what how did i explain it in class the thyroid gland is kind of, ah okay keegan i'm gonna i'm gonna unmute you keegan unmute No. Okay. All right. So here's what Keegan said. Isn't it like a sponge? And then when you do surgery, you squeeze the sponge and it pushes a whole lot of thyroid, leftover thyroid hormone into the system. That is what happens, which shoots the metabolism through the roof, not nervous system. It has nothing to do with the nervous system. It, it does make you jittery but not because I'm overstimulating that system. I'm, I'm over metabolism. Now, why, why did somebody say hypocalcemia? This is the kind of stuff that you should be doing with another student. Somebody's asking questions, and if you're not given an answer, then you don't know it. You got to go back and study. You got to give answers. Otherwise, how are you going to evaluate where you're at? Hypocalcemia comes, it's the same deal. Calcitonin is squeezed into the system and all of a sudden just tanks out their calcium level. So, how do you know somebody's going into hypocalcemia? chat window or unmute tetany and cardiac changes great and how do you know somebody's going into thyroid toxicosis their vitals go through the roof their hypermetabolism they're sweating all over the place all that kind of stuff all right so that is where we're going to get to there was only a few more i mean this one is a picture of um hypothyroidism constant fatigue sore cold dry skin fertility issues that means they need thyroid hormone um the next one weakness thirst recent fracture from a minor fall and bradycardia ct shows a possible mass in the neck that one is tough, but that's probably dealing with um, parathyroid issues because that minor fall changes the calcium level. You 
uh, put it into the bloodstream, but it's not in the bones, um, that kind of thing. Um, this one, lots of, this is over the course of maybe a month or two. They go from left image to right image in a month or two or three. Anybody, real quick, disease process? Cushing's, excellent. And so we need to cut out the tumor that's causing it um, or they're on medications. We need to balance those out. This person, they go from... Okay, that doesn't, oh, so you're only looking at the March 2014 image. Don't look at the one that's off screen technically, um, because the 2014 shows a very scrawny individual, and then they recovered in 2015, but 2014, they were diagnosed with all of this stuff. What is that? the 2014 image, darker skin tone, thirsty, weight loss, blood sugars are low, sodium is low, potassium is high, and they're really dehydrated, Addison's. Um, and then this one here, they have a crushing headache at work, peers call 911, their blood pressure is 242 over 110, they're sweating, they're normally fine, but this person just all of a sudden, boom. What will all of a sudden change your heart rate and vitals significantly? And actually, I should probably say, uh, get rid of the sweating. We're going to make it that. Heart rate of 142 and a blood pressure of, I don't know, the same numbers. There you go. 258 over 126. When EMS showed up, they were fine. So they went... They were fine. They went up real fast, and then they were fine again. What's going on? They're going to die if you don't figure this out. Like, legit, no joke. They were fine. Blood pressure and heart rate went through the roof, and then a few minutes later, they were fine again. Y'all need to go look at pheochromocytoma. That's an adrenaline issue. Um, then as the patient was getting dressed and putting shoes on, they began to experience all the previous manifestations. So once again, it came back. So, all right. It was a little bit longer than I expected, but it was worth my time. Um, and now I need to jump off and do office hours. So if the student who's doing office hours will go to the office hour link, I'll see you there in a minute. Have a great night. You're all very welcome. Thanks for hanging out with me so late. Super fun.